welcome you this morning to this conference. Uh, the Institute of International and European Affairs brought together a very distinguished group of people uh, to uh, discuss some very important issues this morning. Uh, but first of all, I'd like to thank our sponsors. Uh, first of all, McCann Fitzgerald, um, Barry Devereaux and his team have been uh, fantastic in supporting the Institute and we really want to thank them for their support. And Deloitte um, are also supporting us today. And um, Brendan Jennings and David Carson and their team. And the Sunday Business Post, uh, our media partners. Uh, the Institute of International European Affairs for the last three decades has been bringing thought leaders together, has been attempting to influence policy and shape ideas, and it's in that spirit that we come together today to discuss issues of great importance to Ireland. On the 10th of April 1998, a historic settlement was reached by the Irish and UK governments, which brought to an end decades of violence in Northern Ireland. The Good Friday Agreement was the product of years of tireless negotiating, and we have seen the transformation occur before our eyes over the last two decades in Northern Ireland. With Tuesday, 10th of April 2018, marking the 20th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement, this conference seeks to commemorate this important milestone by bringing together a panel of former Tishi to outline their perspectives on the 1998 peace settlement and its influence on the current Brexit negotiations. The safeguarding of the Good Friday Agreement has been to the forefront of the concerns of the Irish government and the European Commission negotiating team in the Brexit discussions. Considering the Good Friday Agreement was brought about through cooperation between the Irish and UK governments within the context of joint membership of the European Union, concerns relating to Ireland have been rightly prioritised in the negotiations thus far. This will now change as focus turns to the future relationship, but Ireland cannot lose sight of securing the best possible outcome for the maintenance of the Good Friday Agreement once the UK has left the European Union. This remains of paramount importance for the Irish Government and this will require the development of a new framework considering Ireland and the UK will no longer be joint members of the EU. Ireland and Britain are tied together through our shared history, our culture and common language, our political relationship development developed from one of dependence to independence and now interdependence in the words of one of our UK policy group members Paul Gillespie. Relations on the island of Ireland have developed as a direct consequence of the 1998 settlement and relations were further enhanced through the St Andrews Agreement which brought the DUP in. The effect of the Good Friday Agreement has, has had on north-south relations, east-west relations and more importantly the relations between communities in Northern Ireland cannot be understated. Turning to the present and looking to the future there is little doubt that these relations have strained as the Brexit negotiations have intensified. Northern Ireland is experiencing a crisis of its own. The absence of an executive in Northern Ireland has exacerbated strained relations as it means that the voice of Belfast is missing from this Brexit debate and instead we are relying upon individual political parties who do not represent the region as a whole. Beyond Brexit and beyond the consolidation of the Good Friday Agreement, Ireland will now need to pay more attention than ever to being an active EU member state and this will involve deepening alliances and relations with countries across the Union. The second panel of today's conference will examine the dynamics at play in the European Union without the UK and panellists will analyse the political complexion of this new union. The balance of power will have shifted in the EU without the UK and Ireland of course will, uh, will need to maintain its good working relations with France and with Germany. The importance of a relationship with the UK and the EU has been referred to many times but should not be overstated. And it is relevant to point out here that our two countries have diverged on issues such as monetary union, agricultural policy and indeed social policy. The irony that the UK were in the EU negotiating opt-outs and now out negotiating opt-ins has been noted by others. But the Irish government will also have to be more active in coalition building. We have already seen Ireland develop its cooperation with Nordic and Baltic states. This is something that will have to continue into the future and indeed there is potential to build alliances on issue specific areas with no numerous member states. A question for the Irish government however is how to reconcile an increasing focus on the EU26 with the political energy required to assist, assist with not just the resumption of devolved powers in the north but sustaining those devolved powers. George Mitchell said that the road to the Good Friday Agreement was 700 days of failure followed by one day of success. Even after 1998, as we will hear later on, many hours were dedicated to ensuring implementation of what had been agreed. 
The Brexit negotiations and the absence of an executive in the North over the last 14 months have taught us that we cannot take the agreement for granted, and indeed the peace process, as it has been rightly termed, is just that, a process that will no doubt continue for the next 20 years and beyond. In some ways, the agreement was fashioned for a multi-party system in Northern Ireland rather than the increasingly two-party system. It was designed for circumstances in which both the UK and the Republic of Ireland were members of the EU. It was designed by politicians, British, Irish and otherwise, who had prioritised an enormous amount of their time for little gain in many cases, and who had lived through the daily horrors of the Troubles in the 70s and 80s. It is now for a new generation of political leadership uh, to reframe the vision to deliver the promise that the Good Friday Agreement captured. We hope that this important conference will focus on the legacy of the Good Friday Agreement and how its provisions have come to exercise so much gravitational pull on the type of Brexit that may ultimately emerge. The agreement captured an essential feature of the Union writ large. That is, that you could hold more than one identity, British and Irish, British and European, Irish and European, perhaps even Catalan and Spanish, a political accommodation for complex identities. The Union provided a political framework for the idea that it is not incompatible to have a strong sense of Irishness within a more fully integrated Union in the same way that the Good Friday Agreement captured the compatibility of British and Irish in Northern Ireland. To discuss these themes in more depth, it gives me great pleasure to welcome to this stage the first panel, and this will be chaired by one of the most distinguished journalists in Ireland, Olivia O'Leary. So please give a warm welcome to Olivia O'Leary and the first panel. Thank you very much. Can I put you here, Bert? Beside me. Yeah, beside me. And Bertie, would you go in the middle? And John at the end. Yeah. Grant. Good morning, everybody. And the first thing that I have to do is to tell you to turn off the awful phones, would you please, in case the phone is still on, just check if you can that it's off. And of course, to warn you about the exits, should anything untoward happen, as you see, they're all lit up around you. Just take a note of them, as I say, in case you need to know where they are. We're very fortunate to be joined this morning by an elite uh, club, three people who ran the country and were responsible for the complex web of British-Irish and Northern relations and EU relations during the lead-up to the, uh, and the working indeed afterwards of the Good Friday Agreement of 1998, the Good Friday Belfast Agreement. Uh, all three former Tishi are going to give us the benefits of their thoughts on the Good Friday Agreement, on the conditions that led to the settlement, the role the EU played in those conditions, and the impact that Brexit might have on the region now and for Anglo-Irish relations. We'll divide the session into three parts. Uh, to begin with, speakers are going to offer their, their personal reflections on the topic, drawing from their experience in office. They'll each speak for about five to ten minutes, uh, and then we'll have a discussion, and then we'll open uh, to the floor for questions. And I'm going to introduce them in chronological order. John Bruton served as Taoiseach from 1994 to 97, having become Fine Gael leader in 1990. Previously, he served as Minister for Finance, Minister for Industry and Energy, Minister for Industry, Trade, Commerce and Tourism. As Taoiseach, he was deeply involved in the Northern Ireland peace process, which led to the Good Friday Belfast Agreement. So, John, will we start with you? Your reflections first, please. It seems to me to be inevitable if Britain leaves both the customs union and the single market that there will have to be controls on movement of goods uh, across the border, uh, either to check whether tariffs have been levied or on the safety of goods or the safety of, of material or whether the goods have been subsidised in some way that would be constituting unfair trade. And we know from history that the existence of border posts, however unobtrusive these might be, symbolizes for many people the partition of the country, which to many people is something that they don't or are disinclined to accept. And that uh, is, I think, therefore become, going to become potentially a target. Also, I think we have to rec recognize that 
even as it is where the only differences between North and South uh, are in the levels of taxation of certain pro excisable products, that there is significant smuggling and that smuggling is closely allied uh, potentially to paramilitary and criminal activity. Obviously, if Britain departs from the European Union has, and has different levels of tariff levied on different levels of goods, the opportunities uh, for smuggling will dramatically increase and hence potential uh, funding sources for criminal activity will also commensurately increase. Uh, it has also been pointed out by, by many people that the, the Good Friday Agreement is not just a legal agreement, it's a state of mind. And the state of mind that it aimed to create was one where of equality, that people had respect for one another, for the traditions that they had, and they could express, them, express those traditions in different ways. And one of the expressions that, that's available to nationalists who live in Northern Ireland is that they can have an Irish passport. Uh, that means they are essentially European citizens, although not resident in the EU, but if the UK is taken out of the European Union. Uh, and that symbolism will be, I think, adversely affected by the, the creation of any form of trench. Uh, I also think, and uh, this would be my last point, I don't want to, 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 say, to say all the things that my colleagues would want also to say. Um, the, 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 British um, Brexit Secretary, Mr. Davis, has said on a number of occasions uh, recently that two things which are potentially contradictory. One, he has said, well, there should be no difficulty having an agreement for mutual recognition because after all, our standards and EU standards on the day of Brexit will be the same. So no problem, he says. But then, perhaps to a different audience, he says, there will be divergence after Brexit. We will be changing the, uh, tr the, the, the re regulations in unspecified areas after Brexit in order to give expression to the fact that we have, quotes, taken back control, end quotes. Now, of course, that devalues the first statement, uh, and it creates a circumstance where the agreement that's made ab at the initial point of Brexit won't hold for any length of time and will have to be constantly renegotiated every time Britain decides to uh, remind itself that it's taken back control by having a slightly different standard. Now he says, oh, there will be mutual recognition. But mutual recognition has something, as I understand it, that has to be negotiated case by case, product by product, service by service. It's not something that you can you know, buy a blanket mutual recognition of everything uh, and proceed to diverge. Uh, and the amount, and this is was the, the, the last point I want to make, the amount of civil service and executive time that's go being taken up by Brexit up to Brexit Day and will be absorbed by Brexit afterwards for years and years to come. This will be a huge diversion of talented people that we need to be building a dynamic society in a part of the world that's aging relative to the rest of the world and needs dynamism to be increased rather than decreased if it's to hold its own. The diversion, the diversion of talent that Brexit constitutes is an unmitigated tragedy for Britain, for Ireland, and for Europe. Uh, I wish I could be optimistic and say I can see a way through to ensure that it doesn't happen, but as of this moment, um, I don't. But my colleagues, of course, are congenitally more optimistic, I've no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the nature of the beast, I suppose. <laughs> they, they, they no doubt have solutions. Okay, well, I mean, we can hear the frustration, absolute frustration in, in, in that contribution. So I'm moving on now to um, the man who does smile a lot and is indeed an optimist, Bertie O'Hearn. Whether he can be an optimist in this situation, we don't know. He was Taoiseach from 97 to 2008, having become leader of Fianna Fáil in 1994. Before that, he served as Minister for Finance, Minister for Industry and Commerce, Minister for Arts, Culture and the Gaeltacht, and Minister for Labour. As Taoiseach, he was a central figure in the long and often very difficult negotiation of the Good Friday Belfast Agreement, which was signed just before he left office in 1998. So, Bertie O'Hearn, your, your reflections. 
Thanks, Olivia. I, I think we're looking back, first of all, on, on 20 years of, of the agreement. Uh, it, its successes have been that there's peace in the North, and I think the peace has held well and hopefully will continue to, uh, to hold good. It's changed the atmosphere of, of politicians, even though there are difficulties, but at least politicians in Northern Ireland talk to each other now. People can forget that it was almost impossible to get them to sit in the one room uh, at one time. Uh, as we went through the anniversary recently, a lot of people who, who, who were not uh, involved or who were young at the time found it hard to believe that we'd only two or three meetings where everybody was in the one room. So now I think they, they can deal with each other, they operate together and they work together. Uh, and, and just moving quickly, I, I think the, the kind of issues that they've resolved over the years working together, the reform of policing, uh, prisoners, decommissioning, the change of the criminal justice system, the equality legislation, there are enormous issues. The, the, the issues that are still outstanding um, are, are not of the same magnitude. I, and I wouldn't say they're non-issues, that would be incorrect, but they're certainly not issues that are of the substance that should prevent them finding a solution. And having spent the last two weeks in the North and talking to them all, I, I do believe that they'll, they'll get back at it again. Um, Brexit has complicated it, there's no doubt about that. People are sitting on the defence far more than they would have otherwise, and it's also given them excuse to sit on defence um, if they needed that in Northern Ireland. Uh, so uh, we now have to try and deal with that issue best we can. Uh, I've said to some of the organisers the other day, uh, none of us and nobody mentioned in 1998 that there was a possibility that uh, the Republic of Ireland and the UK would be out of the European Union. It was not something uh, that was even uh, put down on a, a long list. Uh, it, it, unfortunately, that's not the position now. There's a number of references to the European Union in the Good Friday Agreement uh, where we thought we would continue to cooperate. Uh, the Commission, of course, and the uh, President uh, were, were very helpful always in the European context of what we were doing, not only during the negotiations of the Good Friday Agreement, but for the, the years afterwards and uh, during my time and, and, and after my time. They were always helpful in the Peace Fund and, and all the other ways, and we, we need to acknowledge the, the European dimension uh, of that. From the negotiations now, yeah, I, I think one of the, the problems, Olivia, is that there's a lot of new people. There's new people in the governments, there's new people in the parties. Uh, that makes life a little bit more difficult. Some people don't fully engage with maybe the history or the operation or issues. And you know, it's a, it's a different British government to the British government we have dealt with down, down through the years. Uh, and even uh, on the Tory side, who weren't in power then, but you know, there were it's different personalities, and that's made um, certainly life more more complex. Um, can we find a way out? I, I, I'm not going to say I totally disagree with John because there's no point in saying we see an optimistic view um, when the, that morning headlines in the UK is that the Prime Minister very late last night uh, found that it was necessary to make another statement uh, late on a Sunday night to say that she is not for turning on the, the Customs Union. Uh, that's because of the vote in, in the Commons on Thursday. I assume um, we would all hope, but it doesn't seem likely, uh, that the, the Customs Union, as we know the Customs Union, that the UK will sign up to that. Uh, I would love to see that happen, but I'm not optimistic on that. And even if they did, uh, a point that's forgotten, that wouldn't even be enough. The Customs Union equals tariffs and controls, and um, but it, it doesn't meet what John was just mentioned there about regulatory standards. Uh, the regulatory standards are part of the Single European Act, are, are, are part of, of, of what is the um, what, what, we, what we need in, in that to, to, you know, to take the, the rest of the, the, the parts with it. And that's not likely at all. So I think the, the difficulty that we have, even if we got a customs union, that wouldn't solve the the problem. Now, 
I would hope, as time goes on, uh, that the reason, the main reason uh, British Tories are opposed to the, the Customs Union uh, is that they feel they would not have power uh, to deal with third countries and trade agreements. Uh, where I would be optimistic, it doesn't seem to me beyond the bounds of possibility uh, that you could have an agreement ultimately uh, in the EU-UK trade agreement that would say that the UK uh, could negotiate with countries that haven't already a trade agreement uh, with uh, the European Union. Uh, that would allow them the flexibility uh, to do that. Because, and my logic in that is simple, and if I can put it in a few sentences, why would the UK want to go and organise all the new agreements with countries that the EU already have trade agreements? Are they going to get better terms? Uh, are countries going to give a better agreement to a country with under 70 million than they have with uh, a block that's 450 million? Uh, I would doubt it. And the, the point that's made by Boris uh, continually is that this is the key issue, uh, that they have that freedom. So if they do an agreement, WTO, and remember, when the UK uh, break next March, 29th of March next year, and they pull out uh, of uh, the European Union, they're then out of the WTO, they have to apply for the WTO, they, ha they lose the 53 agreements they presently have, they have to go and reenact all of those agreements individually. Um, that's talk about taking up time of public servants and civil servants, uh, but that, that doesn't seem uh, a likely, a likely uh, a good thing to be doing. So I, I, I think perhaps it won't be called the customs union as we call it today, but something very close to it, that they might agree, agree to that. Um, the idea, I don't want to be either emotive or alarmist about it, but the, the idea of us going back to any kind of a border um, uh, would be a disaster. I, I don't believe it would ever happen. You wouldn't have to wait for violence. The communities um, on both sides of the borders, uh, with their bare hands, it pull down any attempt to put anything up. So we, you wouldn't have to wait too long. So that's not going to happen. The Irish government have rightly, in my view, uh, and repeatedly ruled out a technological solution. Right up until last week, in the discussions in Brussels, they said that is not a runner, and I think they're, they're right on that. So the negotiations continue. Um, the one fear I have, uh, and, and this is my one Tuppence Hapney bit of advice, uh, I really think the government should try to conclude as much as they can in June on this. Uh, I think running it close, uh, running it down to Halloween, to October, uh, is dangerous. Uh, because this would be my fear. Um, and with the former president here and knows how these things work in European councils, all of us have spent a lot of our life in European councils. But if you come down to the last few days, my fear is that our Taoiseach would be uh, called in by the French and the Germans, by the Commission, um, by the presidency, uh, 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 and they would be put to them, listen, the British are paying their 50 billion. Uh, they are ready to conclude um, on freedom of movement. Uh, they're ready to, uh, to move on a, a whole lot of other issues. Uh, we have a good EU trade agreement. Uh, we have a transition period that is up to December 2020 and maybe beyond if, if necessary. And the future relationship, which can't be agreed until the UK are out of the European Union, so that can't happen until after next March, but they can say it's looking very promising. And we don't think you Irish should push just as hard as you're pushing, and we think it's two o'clock in the morning, and we think maybe it should give a bit of a compromise. And um, That's how it works. That's how it always works. Um, and, you know, I think the Irish government are doing well. I have no criticism with the negotiation, but I don't think they should find themselves having a Halloween party at two o'clock in the morning of that nature, I think that's a, that's a risk too far. So therefore, they have to try, I, I don't think conclude an agreement by the end of June. I don't think that's going to be possible because you're not going to have a EU-UK agreement by the end of June. But I think they need to get, remember, the withdrawal agreement 
the protocol of the withdrawal agreement, which is what deals with Northern Ireland, deals with the relationship with the UK, that's the crucial bit for us. The rest of it, there's plenty of others looking after it, and I just think we need to try and get as much as we can on that by, by the end of this June. You'd know all about Halloween parties at 2 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, we'll move on now to our final speaker. Brian Cowan became Taoiseach and leader of Fianna Fáil in 98, only months after the signing of the Good Friday Belfast Agreement, and he remained Taoiseach until 2011. Before that, he served as Minister for Finance, Minister for Health and Children, Minister for Transport, en Energy and Communications, and Minister for Labour. Brian Cowan, your thoughts? Well, thanks to Vivian. Good morning to everyone. Um, I think it has been clear from my two predecessors' uh, reflections thus far. I mean, no one has a, a simple solution to, what, to this problem. And uh, even if one had, I think, as distinguished as this audience is, we wouldn't be telling you either, because unless this is done in the negotiating process itself, then its, it's value could well be uh, diminished if there was some good idea that would get us across the, the line on this. Regarding the Good Friday Agreement, first of all, I mean, <clears throat> um, my two predecessors have, were, were centrally involved in this, and, and uh, I came more into it in terms of the implementation phase and police reform and stuff like that. But the, the question really is that we have some very complex constitutional principles that were agreed in that agreement. There were two documents. There was the inter-party agreement between the parties. And then there was the British-Irish Agreement, which binds that and all future governments. And um, it was recently said, when there was some case law on this in the English courts, that the Good Friday Agreement, as, a, as part of the British constitutional construct, is as central to it as Magna Carta. You wouldn't think that, listening to some of the comments being made, that this is something that can be thrown aside for some expedient, immediate reason, like leaving the European Union. Um, and what John Bruton has, and Bertie have said regarding this whole question of citizenship and the rights of citizen, that citizenship accords people who reside there. For example, you can be Irish, you can be British, you can be British or Irish, you can be British and Irish if you want, um, which means you can hold two passports, one of which is a member of the European Union and one which isn't. And what does that mean for the rights of EU citizens? in that area, subsequent to Brexit. These are not issues that can be, that can be dismissed lightly. So um, <clears throat> the constitutional balance that was struck, uh, which talked about you know, obviously maintaining the status quo until the majority on both sides of the border would agree otherwise, and that the British government would facilitate a different constitutional arrangement should that be the wish of the people, um, that's a much more balanced constitutional construct than would have been the case back in 1920. So <clears throat> now that a decision has been made by the British government to leave the European Union, um, these are central issues for the people who live in the North, quite apart from the day-to-day -day problems that arise when, when a, a country becomes a non-member and has a neighbour which is a member. The second point I'd make is, of course, is that it was envisaged that our continued membership of the European Union would provide a stream, if you like, of the dynamic relationship developing and maturing over time. And that was certainly the case from 1973 to 1998. And those who have been involved in promoting Ireland's interests within Europe um, found a very excellent forum, if you like, in which the relationship developed between <coughs> Britain, British and Irish governments in a way that wasn't possible prior to membership. One would be very concerned about how that relationship will develop in a new situation where Britain is no longer a member of the European Union. <coughs> and that sort of readily available interaction uh, is denied us because of the fact that Britain had left. I would also agree that the European Union, it should be remembered, was and continues to be very supportive of the whole peace process. Uh, throughout that period, and the solidarity that was shown to Ireland uh, in, in that context uh, should be acknowledged, and hopefully we will find a way of maintaining that link with the European Union in terms of developing civil society there in, in, and developing a more accommodating political culture 
in the north as a result of the Good Friday Agreement being implemented. So that's on the, the Good Friday side of the house. Related to Brexit, um, the real problem is we want to maintain a good relationship with Britain post-Brexit, let's be clear. Uh, we want the relationship within the island of Ireland and the logic of the island economy to allow develop over time as well. And certainly some arrangement on, regarding the island of Ireland has to be sorted out, particularly in relation to agriculture and agricultural products. Not just, not just that, but particularly in relation to that matter because we have cross-border um, arrangements there in terms of supply of product to many of these, you know, to, to dairies and to creameries, north and south. The whole rural economy is based upon that interdependence being respected and being allowed to continue in a daily, on a daily basis. So some accommodation has to be made there. <clears throat> I think the problem is, as we've seen in the Good Friday Agreement, constructive ambiguity can get you so far. It helps the process to proceed until things start to develop and certain issues are left in brackets that can be reverted to if progress is made on other issues. <clears throat> but I think that there comes a point where, you know, the concrete specifics have to be addressed. <clears throat> I mean, I respect the British Prime Minister's dilemma and her problems <clears throat> to say that, you know, this is a, the backstop is something that no British Prime Minister can accept. Well, it was no British Prime Minister could accept it except herself because she accepted it on the 8th of December. And it has legal standing. And the legal documentation has been put together. So this level of inconsistency in terms of the approach doesn't help to um, instill confidence that we can get a solution. Now, I'm not saying for one moment we shouldn't have a solution. We have to get a solution. What is being hoped for, and I read what the former Director General of the Commission said yesterday in one of our papers, I mean, the hope is that some pragmatic um, strategy will, will emerge beyond the ideology that's dominating the debate thus far and that the engagement between the EU and the, the, e, and the UK negotiators will get into that level of detail. In the event of time not being available to do that sufficiently, the question of a transition period being there that will maintain the status quo pending these matters being resolved provides us with the avoidance of a cliff edge uh, problem that would be of, of, of major proportions and a serious economic dislocation to both economies. So, um, as a former teacher, all I can do is wish the present one well. I don't see, I don't see I can be of any more help to him. Um, <laughs> and certainly, and certainly, I'm not first on his list. I'm sure. But, um, but I wish them well. I mean, they, they have, they have. I mean, I have great confidence in the, you know, in our representatives and our people at diplomatic level, who, whom I know from first-hand experience both in relation to the Northern question and as the EU matters are of the highest caliber and are well respected by their peers throughout the European Union. So I have no fears in that score that our case isn't being heard and taken into account. But what needs to happen, as Bertie has said, is we need to see some progress in concrete detailed terms very soon rather than this general reassurance that there is a solution, and if only we could sit down, I think David Trimble said we could sort it out in an hour and a half. I dealt with David Trimble. I don't think he'd sort out a whole lot with David in an hour and a half on anything, but uh, <laughs> certainly not on an issue as complex as this. Yeah. Um, just to throw it out to, to all of you, it, certainly to somebody of my generation, the, one of the most important underpinnings of the peace in Northern Ireland and the complicated uh, Good Friday Belfast Agreement settlement was the continuing good relationship between the British and the Irish government. That that was a pillar that meant that neither government was any more going to be held hostage by its own extremists, that both governments could learn to work together. And indeed, the secretariats, the officials on both sides also had, had, had that good relationship. Um, 
Bertie, you had a terrific relationship with, with Tony Blair. John, you would have known John Major in your time. Uh, Brian, you would have known uh, Gordon or Brown. And these personal relationships were important as well. Is there a fear, because certainly to somebody of my generation, I feel that fear, that that relationship has already been damaged by Brexit? and that it's going to take an awful lot to get that back on track. Well, it has, is, is, is the, the truth. Um, and I agree with what has been said about, Brian, about the, uh, the officials and our diplomatic effort, but I, I, I think I can say no more than there hasn't been a meeting at the Intergovernmental Conference under the, the agreement for a long time. And I think you don't have to be a former teacher to work out why that hasn't happened. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the difficulty, but, is down the road, and you know, John and Ryan have said this that you know, from '73 until today, every week there are endless number of officials from this country meeting British officials. There's working groups, there's advisory groups, there's think tanks. They're all there working, and we've held the most senior positions. They're here in this room today. Of in, in the in, in the uh, administration uh, of the uh, of the commission, and you know all that relationship. I mean, I got to know Tories and Labour ministers, and my colleagues did really well through European Council meetings. When I was in the Social Affairs Council, the ECOFIN Council, all the years in the European Council, and and the officials did. So we, that that all ends next March. That's finished, finito. And sometimes the British people, officials don't get that um, and you know it's a very important part of the, the life and times. I think but what we could do rather than the Intergovernmental Council being, not having meetings that could become the vehicle after next March where the Irish government and the British government wouldn't always have to meet at Taoiseach and Prime Minister level, they could do that every quarter the finance people could do it on the alternative month every quarter, the industry ministers could do it in the quarter. So that we would continue to have that relationship. Because otherwise we leave, we lose and leave behind 45 years of very good relationship that's been meticulously built up by our civil service. And when you walk into the department, any minister the first day they're told, you know, this is the brief on Europe and the contacts. And you know, it's all very good and, and it, it works very well, but that's over. And that's a big, big loss uh, to us. So, I think we have to find an alternative to that, and you know, in the absence of an alternative in the discussions today, I think that the Intergovernmental Conference could be used for that, or something like it, but I think that's good because there's already a secretary, there's a mechanism there for that. And um, the, the relationships are strained, I think, because, let's be honest, then, you know, when David Davies, you know, I don't, I don't know the man, you know, he. And what he says on a Monday definitely isn't what he says on a Friday. And I suppose maybe in politics we're all guilty of that over our career. But, uh, uh, but the trouble is he'll say something else on the following Monday. So um, he, it, it's, not, it's not easy. And then when he kind of accuses our Taoiseach of being, you know, and God, it just really shows what he doesn't know about Irish politics, that he's in the pocket of Sinn Féin or something, he said, you know, you know he, 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 does, he doesn't get it too well. And um, anyway, I, I, the British, I have sat across the table with the British in all kinds of negotiations, cap reform, structural funds, the North. They're, they're a clever bunch. And I have no doubt that they have worked through what they can give on the word that they prefer, um, which is not the single market, not, not the customs union, um, it, regulatory alignment. Mm. And it's the word the DUP like as well. So, so let's stick on regulatory alignment. If regulatory alignment can bring us a solution that means there's not any change of substance between the present single market mm. and the customs union, then I think we can buy it. I don't think, at this stage, there is much point um, in trying to beat the drum just on the customs union and single market. I think we have to move a bit and make regulatory alignment, as per the December deal, um, stand up. Um, 
uh, and, and, and nail it down. I mean, the, I think the British government have said recently that they're quite happy that regulatory alignment and the backstop will go in to the protocol um, in June on the withdrawal agreement. Mm. So I think our Attorney General and our League of People have to try and nail that down. But it seems to me that's where the game is. But yeah. your question was, have we lost? We have, but I think we just have to win that back. It's been a, it's been a, a bad two years um, since the vote. Yeah. And I just think we have to try and push forward rather than worrying about that last two years. John Burton, can I put that point to you? I mean, somebody of my generation would have watched those years and years and years of building up a good relationship with Britain, including Garrett Fitzgerald's Anglo-Irish Agreement, which was probably you know, the, the beginning of certainly formalizing that agreement. And the danger now that without that EU context, which in a way diluted tensions that might have been there otherwise, without that context, how are we going to get back onto an even keel in terms of the relationship? And what do you think of Bertie Hearn's suggestion about using the intergovernmental uh, conference to do that? I, I would have no difficulty with using the intergovernmental conference, but you'd have to decide what would be on the agenda, because people don't go to meetings unless there's some business to be done. Just going to meetings for the sake of meetings uh, is not something they'll persuade busy ministers to do other than send some junior along to. Uh, I think it's a little bit wider than, than has been said already in terms of the change that EU, sh EU membership made to the relationship between Britain and Ireland. Between 1922 and, and 1973, no British Prime Minister ever felt it was worth his while to come to meet his Irish counterpart on this island. Every meeting involved the Irish Taoiseach or President of the Executive Council of the day going to London. And that indicated to me and indicates to me an unequal relationship, an unhealthily unequal relationship in terms of the sort of complexes on our part that that inequality engendered and the patronising attitude that was expressed on the other side. That all changed when Britain joined the EU. Yeah. Ted Heath okay. came to visit Liam Cosgrave yeah. uh, in Baldonnell in Ireland within months of Ireland joining uh, along with the UK and Denmark, the European Union. And that represented a huge change in the psychological relationship. All those old complexes, big versus small, were dissolved by the fact that we were both members of something bigger than either of us. And I think the relationship that was in engendered in the margins of other council meetings, where there was no Anglo-Irish issue at all to be discussed, but we were together working to solve a European problem, mm. that developed a sort of sense of mutual respect between the two English-speaking members of the European Union, as it then, uh, as it was. Yeah. Uh, that's now not going to be there. I mean, uh, I applaud the suggestions that both Brian and, and Bertie have made, but they don't replace that sort of common endeavour that yeah. is, 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 was, was, was manifest in, in our attending from the lowest working group right up to summits in the, in the European Union. Yeah. I think the other thing that has to be re recalled about Britain staying in the customs union, uh, which may be a lost cause or may not, it's a long way to October, is that most customs unions that the EU have do not cover agriculture. And we will need to have clarity if we were to have free trade in agricultural goods across the border, is there going to be the same level of support for our farmers on either side of the border? Is, is Britain going to keep having some sort of common agricultural policy similar to our policy? Because if they don't, if they are permitting uh, imports, however safe those imports may be from other parts of the world, and they are then able to compete on the EU market with their product, knowing that their market is supplied from elsewhere, and thereby able to undercut EU producers, that's going to distort the agricultural market, as Brian said. And I think we, it's a very sensitive uh, market. And I think it's also important to say that because of the safety requirements um, and the food scares that there have been in, in Europe in particular, there's going to be a very high level of insistence in, 
in, in Brussels on the part of all the member states to ensure that nothing but the safest food product enters the EU food chain. And once a, a consignment of beef or a, consign, or a, or a lorry, lorry of milk crosses the border at Newry, it's entering the EU food chain. And that has to be assured. Uh, and there is, uh, as I understand it, in the Common Customs Code of the EU and in the requirements in regard to phytosanitary controls, there is a requirement for physical inspections, for a minimum proportion of all consignments to be physically inspected before they enter the EU market. Now, where is that going to be done? And how is it going to be done? These are questions for which I, no an answers have been forthcoming. And I thought it was very interesting that uh, the, no, the House of Commons Northern Ireland Committee, which, as I understand, is chaired by a, a Euro, uh, Eurosceptic Conservative MP, uh, th they had a report which I, I, I think contains the most telling quotation of all about this issue in regard to the frictionless border that was promised. I quote, the committee said, we had no visibility of any technical solutions anywhere in the world beyond aspirational that would remove the need for physical checks at the border. That's from the Northern Ireland Committee chaired by a Brexit MP containing numerous unionists, uh, unfortunately no Irish nationalists because of decisions taken uh, by, by, by another political party that's not on this platform. Uh, <coughs> but I mean, that's, that's the rea reality we're, we're facing. Um, and I, 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 I'm, I'm very, very, very worried about it. Um, yeah. I, 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 I think alignment is one thing. And you can have alignment of regulations. But you have to have interpretation of those regulations has to be consistent. And judicial decisions where there's disputes about interpretation has to be consistent. And if you have that the Supreme Court of Appeal on the British side is going to be the UK Supreme Court, and the ultimate source of appeal in interpreting what a regulation means or a, an aligned regulation constitutes, on the EU side is going to be a different court, the European Court of Justice, you're going to have the possibility of divergent interpretations of the same rules, yeah. which is going to lead to problems. Brian, can I turn to you, and, and not to move off from the yeah. subject John's been talking about, but behind it the fact that all of these problems are going to have to be discussed, hopefully, between two countries who have some time for one another and some trust for one another. Um, in terms of bringing that relationship back on the rails, because goodness knows it's gone off the rails. I mean, I remember 1971, I'm that old, and I remember the catcalling that went on across the Irish Sea between Jack Lynch and Ted Heath at the time of the exchange of telegrams and the rowing. And I remember as a young woman thinking, this ain't no way to run a railroad. These people should be talking behind closed doors. They should be talking quietly and constructively. How do we stop ourselves going back to catcalling across the Irish Sea? Well, I don't, I don't think we're going to go back to that. I mean, you know, there are tensions often arise during negotiating, you know, where things are said in order just to put down a marker, but it's not, it doesn't mean, you know, that's it. Hmm. Um, and there will be provocative things said from people who don't have direct responsibility in the negotiations, which can often uh, put p get people upset too and things are, are said in reply because to leave them go unanswered might be to give them legitimacy. So I think that there's sufficient maturity in the, in the British and Irish governments to realise that this relationship that we have, this bilateral relationship, not alone in relation to how the island of Ireland operates, but the need for us to, to work closely together, even though non-membership obviously makes it more difficult. I mean, that's just the, the, the reality of the situation. We can't carry on as if this is a small thing you know, they're leaving the European Union and things can go on as before. That's just not the way the world works. And certainly from the European Union's perspective in terms of their negotiation, they're not going to end up with a situation where non-membership uh, is a burden-free zone, where mm. other countries, other pop, you know, there are other countries um, in recent times that have shown a, a popular swing towards um, you know, having a different relationship with the European Union. So therefore, the, the negotiators are all about trying to ensure that the, that the integrity of the single market is maintained. 
There are certain things you can get around, um, but if you look at the demands that are being made on the British side in terms of the movement, the control over the movement of people, um, the question of being able to run their own trade agreements, the question of uh, the various things that they have set out for themselves, six or seven basic points. Um, there is no precedent deal with any other country that covers this. This is one of the problems. We don't have a, we can't go to the Canadian trade deal and say that will cover it, or the mm. Turkish deal won't cover it, mm. or the, uh, the Swiss model of 120 agreements with bilateral agreements won't cover it. Uh, so therefore, you know, you, you, of the seven issues, I think the British Irish Chamber of Commerce did out a, a very good tabular statement which showed maybe it might be three or four that one particular deal would cover, but not all seven. So therefore, we don't have a precedent. We've never had a country leaving the European Union before. Um, and so therefore, we're, we're in sort of a new frontier country here as to how we handle it. But the question really is that the, the European Union have to maintain the integrity of the single market. I mean, they can't, you can't come to an accommodation that messes up your own foundations uh, either. Uh, and as has been said, in some cases, people are takers here rather than givers in terms of what's available. So we know what people want. What can they get that doesn't mess up the whole house mm. is a big issue for us. But, but whilst we're standing our ground on defending our essential national interests, and we've seen why these things are important for us, and the government is doing that, any Irish government have the duty to do that, it doesn't mean that we're trying to develop an acrimonious relationship with those who have decided and whose, whose decision we have to respect to leave the union. But we are saying to them that we need answers to some very, very important questions. And as I say, we're getting to the stage in the negotiations where now some flesh has to be put on the bone here. And um, I don't believe that that should result in an acrimonious outcome. Far from it, I believe that the challenge to the next political generation on both sides of the Irish Sea is to find the ways and means by which we can replace that European interaction in some way that gives cognizance to the importance of the bilateral relationship we have. Because quite apart from anything else, apart from economics, the diaspora issues, there's a whole range of issues on the human level. There are. And common the travel area which is going to be respected. Yeah. Uh, all of that is, is main, maintains a status quo insofar as you can have it, but where, as I say, one of them is, is a non-member. But we're, we're, we're speaking at the moment in the context of the uh, Good Friday Belfast Agreement, and there are two things that strike me that arise because of Britain's decision to leave the European Union. Number one, that particularly among nationalists in Northern Ireland, the readiness to accept devolved government was done in the context that it was being done with Britain and Ireland both belonging mm. to the European Union. Now, that context isn't there anymore. Is that going to affect the readiness, particularly of the nationalist community, to be happy with devolved government. And number two, what about all of those people with Irish passports in Northern Ireland that regard themselves both as Irish and as European citizens, and indeed that that Irish passport guaranteed them that position? How do we um, validate their right to be European citizens as well as Irish citizens. Uh, arguably, there'll be more need for the north-south bodies after Brexit than there is today, mm. because to the extent that the UK diverges from EU <laughs> rules, there will be more problems to be solved as far as they apply in Ireland to the two parts of Ireland. Um, and I was very interested, I was at a, a meeting uh, in, in Westminster about a month and a half ago, to hear Geoffrey Donaldson, the, the DUP uh, MP, say that he regretted that there hadn't been an agreement on the devolved administration at that stage. And he said there was never more need, he said, for north-south bodies, yeah. which they were originally not too keen on, never more need than there would be now for those to exist in order to find Irish solutions to EU UK problems, mm. uh, and, and I think we shouldn't we shouldn't we shouldn't be too too pessimistic about that. Um, what I do think we will miss, however, is the sort of uh, contacts between Westminster and Dublin that will be yeah. uh, severed for the reasons we've decided already. Brian, just, just on that point, you ask yeah. about you know it's it's one of the ironies of the situation when the peace fund monies were being allocated and. Um, 
presentations were being made, everyone appeared, uh, the Eurosceptics and people who didn't like the European Union appeared, people who were very pro-European Union appeared because they could see the benefits of it. You know, it's, it's ironic that some people who philosophically as, assign very malign motives to the European Union as an entity now have a very benign view of what the outcome should be to the negotiations. Um, and the same up north. But I mean, that's just a, a point that, that on the aside. The question really that you're asking is, you know, to what extent is the absence of Europe going to impact on the dynamics of peace building in, 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 um, in Northern Ireland? Certainly the lack of resources available to many disadvantaged communities which that support has represented consistently over the last 20 years is something that's going to be sorely felt. It will have to be given greater priority within the national budgets of both governments because it's important work. There are many communities, as we know, in both loyalists and nationalist communities who are totally disenfranchised from, as they see it, the system and have been ignored, as they would see it, within the political culture for, for very many years. Um, so that's an issue. I mean, pr getting the European Union to continue to, to support us in that would be something that we would, I'm sure, advocate as a member of the Union, and perhaps it could be negotiated as part of the exit strategy that people are, are talking about, because it is important. You need to put resources uh, into these situations. You know, empty rhetoric doesn't get you very far in communities that don't see real change on the ground. Um, but I do think that the European Union's whole you know, philosophy of, of equality and solidarity and respect for member states regardless of size, you know, within the treaties and the protection of citizens' rights under the treaties by the Commission, these are all important factors that are going to come into play for those who have Irish passports in a non-member state yeah. and who have the right to citizenship to a member state simultaneously. And I'm not so sure that that was ever given any deliberation during the, the, the referendum campaign. I mean, we all know referendum campaigns can be very difficult to get the, to deal with the issues. De Gaulle always said he never agreed with a referendum in the French Constitution because simply because people don't answer the question you ask them. You have 50 yeah. reasons to give the government a kick. It might be the, the one that's on the, on the ballot paper, but you'll get, you'll get the kick anyway. So, unfortunately, domestic, whilst the theory of referendums are, are important, to recognize that often the, the, the practical outcome is that the, the issue isn't addressed sufficiently at all yeah. uh, for, for us, but we have to live with the decision. So I just say, um, from my point of view, uh, European, the Euro, a, a continuation of European influence by whatever means uh, will be an important factor in helping bring the uh, bring the sort of gel together that make sure, make sure that certain communities don't disintegrate completely. Bertie, that question of <coughs> Brexit and the effect it's going to have on, on the peace process, and comments, say, from people like David Trimble, that the increasing talk about a united Ireland by Sinn Féin, and perhaps by some politicians down here, could result in the renewal of loyalist violence, that spectre emerging. Yeah. I think there are a few points. The first one is, just the effect in, on, on the north. I mean, 80% of the money for agriculture comes from the EU direct. I haven't seen any written commitments um, by the, the government uh, saying that they're going to pay all that money. There's a loose, glib kind of reply that they... I thought there was up to about 2020 or something. Yeah, they, yeah. well, yeah, but that's, that's only the end of the current uh, deal with, for, for the... For the uh, that's the annual budget, but for the next round, uh, there's no, there's no commitment. Now maybe they will. And um, the whole issue of research, which Northern Ireland are very good, Queens, uh, Ulster University, they're huge research departments doing very good work, linked to a lot of innovative small companies in the North's economy. They're all hugely important things. Um, your question, the psychic um, nationalism, the, the, the ideologues are watching this. I saw this for the last fortnight up there talking to people, they, they worry uh, about this and you know, their views would be, their usual views, but I think th this is the danger. The, the danger is, and I've said this directly to the DUP and I've talked to the Lilas groups, I keep in touch 
with them ever, ever since uh, I was involved. And I don't think there's a danger. I, I, I think they're, they're trying hard within the leadership of the UDA, the UFF, Red Hand Commandos, um, uh, to trying to pull themselves away from violence and from criminality and trying to be con constructive as they, they, they can be. And they have their own problems and their own tensions, which is not really a political issue. But I think they're doing their best. So I don't think they're looking for reasons. The difficulty is, but can Northern Ireland continue on to be run by nine excellent civil servants? Um, who are looking for direction on a daily basis to Westminster, who are looking to number 10. Um, there lies the difference. To do that on a long-term basis is not sustainable because we reinvent the wheel. And um, I have said this to all the parties. Like one of the things, and you, you could be cynical about this, but we won't be cynical. Like the big effort now uh, by Sinn Féin's this summer uh, is to organise the 50th anniversary march in Derry for the civil rights movement. Um, but you, you can see where the wheel, you can see where the wheel goes, and um, there, there lies the danger. And I, I, I think it, it is vitally important, Brexit or no Brexit, that the institutions, John has said, the North-South bodies, the intergovernment conference thing. I'm not saying that would be a perfect solution, but at least there's a structure there. But we, we need to get that up anyway. If we continue with no institutions, no contact, I mean, what happens today if there's an Irish minister, one of our ministers here, has an urgent matter and wants to talk to their northern counterpart, it could be, it could be about pig, sheep, God knows what, but an important issue. We saw it in the foot and mouth days, many other examples, where they could pick up the phone, have a meeting, meet in Ballymascanlan as they used to do, um, agree the line, have a statement. They can't do that today. They get onto a civil servant who, who, will, who will say, well, I have to check, where is he checking? He's checking number 10. Number 10 don't want to know anyway. They don't want calls in Northern Ireland. And they, you, know, you can see the, you can see the yeah, problem. Where it's happening. And, and this is, this, if that goes on, if that yeah. goes on, the answer to your question is yes, it creates a big, a big difficulty. It creates difficulty. Brian, would you mind telling me what the time is? Because I've mislaid my watch so and I. I need to keep an eye. You have as well. Bertie. 10 o'clock. That's grand. Okay. Because we're going to turn to the audience. But I just first want to ask the three of you, as it is, all the references to the European Union and the Good Friday Agreement are going to have to maybe be looked at and, and, and rewritten. That, that may have to happen. Is it time, perhaps, to look at the Good Friday Agreement itself and to ask whether what it has done is to produce a government of two extremes who were always going to find it difficult to get on with one another and to exclude those both of the moderate unionist position and the of, of constitutional nationalism. John, is there an argument, and I know people like Jacob Reese, Jacob Reese mogg has said stuff like perhaps the Good Friday Agreement has served its purpose, and people like me got very cross when we heard that, but does he have a point? Is it time to look at it again? Well, I, I think the Good Friday Agreement may well have been the only agreement that could have been reached at the time it was reached. Uh, and I, anything I would say now is not to be construed as a criticism of it. Mm. Uh, but as Barry Andrews said in his introductory speech here, the Good Friday Agreement was put together envisaging two very different circumstances to the ones that are now going to obtain. One was that we both would be in the European Union, and two, that it was for a multi-party situation in Northern Ireland, where you had possi the possibility of shifting coalitions in the centre that could you know, move enable movement in politics and people to take a, a breather from office for a while but still for the basic agreement to be uh, remain operational. The difficulties are to be found both in the Good Friday Agreement itself and in the St Andrews Agreement. The first difficulty in the Good Friday Agreement is that every party is supposed to register if they have their full vote as to whether they are for a united Ireland or for continuing in the UK. Now that's a sort of artificial situation because most people 
on a daily basis in Northern Ireland when they think of public administration. They're not thinking of whether it's ultimately going to be a harp or a crown. They're thinking about whether their refuse is being collected efficiently, whether, the health, whether they can access health service and all of that. And on those sorts of issues, there's no difference between a DUP voter and a Sinn Féin voter. The other uh, problem ar ar arises in regard to St. Andrew's Agreement, where uh, I don't know if Bertie will know the background of this much better than I, but in order to get the DUP on board, I understand, there had to be an agreement that the, deputy f that the first minister would always come from the biggest party. Yeah. And that, of course, meant that there was competition to ensure on the national side that the vote was consolidated to maximise the possibility that the biggest party would be a nationalist party and the equal and opposite incentive on the other side. Yeah. Now, obviously, there's no percentage in reopening these issues at, these time, at this time. If we can get the existing agreement to work, we should get the existing agreement to work. Okay. But at the same time, we should look at it objectively and say that, you know, maybe it's not designed to encourage the sort of mature responsibility-taking politics that you need. Okay. I think there's an aversion to taking responsibility yeah. in Northern mm -hmm. Ireland, yeah. which yeah. arises some, from its status. Some people would call it a lack of ambition, even, in terms well, of Well, a lack of responsibility, which is more yeah. serious. I think. Yeah. Well, I, think, I think what's wrong with, let me say so quickly, I don't believe in replacing the Good Friday Agreement. I believe in implementing the Good Friday Agreement, and it has not been fully implemented. Certainly, the spirit of the agreement is something that we've always tried to propagate from an Irish government point of view. I mean, I come back to this point, there's a constitutional balance here. I mean, we, we brought in, we changed our constitution on the basis that we would obviously com completely agree to the consent principle, but that there would be fairness, there would be equality, there would be a recognition of civil and cultural rights, that there is a substantial number of people within the island of Ireland whose, whose legitimate aspirations for a united Ireland, that that is a legitimate objective, that it shouldn't be seen as subversive as it was for years within the Northern Ireland policy. Yeah. policy. So, you know, to be frank, you know, it's not as British as Finchley, and it never was as British as Finchley, and we have agreed to a compromise here that needs to be implemented. And the rights of those who have as strong a nationalist aspiration as I have must be recognised. Not, and I, I agree it can't be attritional, but it can't be war by another means. I agree with all this political culture has to be more accommodated. That we have to get rid of these exclusivist dogmas that, that's dominated northern politics. And that we've actually agreed, look, it's very simple in my way of thinking. We've all agreed to get on a train. Up to the Good Friday Agreement, we were always concerned about the destination of the train. Now we're just agreed to go on a common journey and we're prepared to be agnostic about where the train will bring us once we're together and we're not beating the head off each other on the train. So, you know, <laughs> let's be fair, but let's get people to recognize that the consent principle for the unions, which provides them with a, the guarantee that they've sought, yeah. uh, was brought about by a constitutional change here, which was to be recognized in the full civil and, and, and cultural rights of the minority population being recognized in how the place is run. And we've seen that in the, in the sort of radical approach, approach there was to police reform. We can't have this creeping incrementalism all the time that says, we'll give you a little bit more, we'll give you a little bit, you know, it's about equality. It's about people being as entitled to be Irish there as they are entitled to be British. Uh, I, I respect that completely. They must reciprocate that respect and give that recognition to the nationalist people. Bertie, just a quick comment on, is the Anglo, is the Good Friday Belfast Agreement perhaps at the stage where it needs to be looked at again? Well, there are two things in this. One is what Rhys Mogg is talking about, and the answer to that is no, because what he yeah. wants to do is set it aside. Yeah. What John is talking about changing some of the procedure rules and the designation of parties, uh, I mean, that has happened, the alliance one stage changed and went unionist to, to, to try or went nationalist, I think, to just get something to get the institutions up and running. So procedural rules, and maybe it was too many procedures, you know, when we set down with too many rules, because like, we were trying to get all the parties, like, we, we, we made the threshold for uh, political partic participation very low to get the, um, 
uh, Davy Irvine and Davy Adams and these people, Billy Hutchison on side. So there were all those kind of things built in. Maybe some of those can change. But the, the attempt by some of our British colleagues is a different thing. Um, they're trying to change the Good Friday Agreement because they see it as an obstacle. Um, and and they, they see it as an obstacle to Brexit. Um, so uh, that's, a, that's a, different, a different debate. Okay, let's open it to the floor and um, I can see a few hands up there already. If you could wait until we get uh, the roving microphones to you and if you wouldn't mind standing up so we can see you and tell us who you are. There's a, a lady there and there's somebody over here as well. Yeah. Um, hi, Olivia. Sarah Carey. Um, in relation to Bertie Hearn's point, and I know it's one that a lot of people have concern of, that we might be dropped over the edge at midnight or 2 a.m. in those negotiations. But I've always viewed it that, rather than look at this from the border being the Northern Ireland Irish border, that it's the border between the UK and the EU, and we're not the weak link, we're the ace in the hole by which the EU negotiating team will force the UK to recognise the inconsistency of their position. So, you know, we might be the winning card, not the people that are going to suffer at the end of this when it's that time late at night. Okay, thank you, Sarah. And I'm going to take another questioner here as well. Yeah. Uh, Ronan Tynan, a filmmaker and co-founder of Esperanza Productions. Actually, I was living in London when the referendum took place and I was a very enthusiastic campaigner for Remain. And I cannot tell you the number of times I received assurances from prominent Brexiteers, including Grayling one night at a packed meeting in Chatham House, that we had nothing to worry about the border. It would remain seamless and this was really almost a non-issue. But now we know it's not a non-issue. And there's one huge concern I have, and I put it to the panel, Reid, that this is, in my view, and certainly in my personal experience, the golden age in Anglo-Irish relations. But it's really the golden age at a people-to-people -people level, at a business-to-business -business level. And I'm really worried at the moment that while the government is obviously doing its best playing hardball at, at global... At, at, uh, at government to government level. Public opinion in Britain has been hugely ignored. There's no real attempt to explain to British people the significance of the reintroduction of the border. And in my view, that's the strongest negotiating card. Well, shall we say the leverage, it increases the government's leverage. And I would equally say the same problem is occurring at a European level. Uh, and I put it to the panel, really, that it's not just at states person to states person level, politician to politician level. We must be concerned at people to people level. And the government, frankly, in my view, I put it to you, and it's not just the government, the opposition have a responsibility to their inter-party connections to be what, doing it as well, should, are not what, doing that. What should they be doing? We need a massive public information campaign, not yeah. to be engaged in partisan politics, but just to explain to people the effect of what for, for England would be to create a border between the north and south of England. We yeah. have to make them understand that because yeah. that's one practical way of putting real pressure. As I found myself, even trying to explain that to people at personal level, it does have an effect. Thank you. Okay, um, Bertie, if I can put that one to you. And, and perhaps the feeling that somehow, while we worry constantly about the peace and the danger of the resumption of violence, is there that same understanding among the public in Britain? Um, Sarah's point, uh, first of all, Sarah, yeah. I, I think the Michel Barnier's team have been top class. I mean, they have, they have really fought the Irish case. Um, but, you know, being there, done that. Uh, I, I know when it comes to the, the evil hour, you know, uh, what, what happens in these things. And I've seen it more times and been part of it when we had the presidency and two of my colleagues have too. Does that the trade off? And you know, I, I'd hate to see. Okay, services isn't in, but the big thing for for our British friends is services. So the services come in at two o'clock in the morning, and they're paying the money. And and what happens to us? And that that's I'm I'm not saying we'll be abandoned, but you know the art of politics and the strength of politics is compromise. It's not a bad thing. It's not an evil thing. Even though I've been accused of that over the years sometimes, but it it, it it's not, it's a good thing. But that's what happens in these games. And I, I'm just saying we should be as far down that line as we can before ultimately it'll come to the, to the late night. And the, the issue, listen, we tried, and, and, and then the Kenny, I, I know, tried and the ministers at the time during the, the, the referendum in, in the UK. And 
I've been over there many times now, and no matter what you said, it was about immigration. Like, if you said anything about anything, it was about immigration. Now nobody seems to, to mention that. I, it, it's, a, it's a hard sell. I mean, we, we've all done kind of interviews on, on British stations about Brexit over the last year, and you know, they, they, they don't get the board. And the question is always asked, so is there going to be a return to violence? And of course you say, no, we're not talking about a return to violence. There will be no return to violence. We're not going back to 30 years of the Troubles. But there are problems. And you try to e e explain that. They don't, they're not really interested in that. And I think the government are doing their best. But it's a hard, it's a hard, hard battle. Our best yeah. friends in this are the, the European 26. But we still need, in the end of the day, to get a deal. And that deal, you know, can I just say if you're about regulatory alignment, the, the, the success of regulatory alignment could be, regulatory alignment could equal customs unit and the single market. I'm not talking about a regulatory alignment that doesn't, but we have to get another name. Like the, the British Tories can't, you know, they, you know, they've got so caught up in it. I think most of them don't understand it, so let's leave that apart. But if you get a different name of regulatory alignment, and, and get what we need into that. I think that's our, I feel that's our best bet. Have you got, have you got a different name or do you think it's better let them come up with a different well, name? Well, you see, the DUP, uh, uh, they, they, my friends in the DUP think regulatory lime's a great idea. So therefore, yeah. sure, listen, if they think it's a great idea, I think it's a great idea, providing it means what I mean. So John, that. John. Um, I, I feel that United Kingdom public opinion never really understood the European Union from the beginning. Uh, smaller countries naturally understand the need for rules and rules that are strictly enforced <coughs> to ensure that there's fair competition in, a, in, a, in an area. In contrast, I think UK public opinion, influenced in part by the common law approach where you agree something in principle and you leave it to judges later on to... to decide what it means, which is completely different to the EU civil law approach, which requires everything to be written down in detailed rules and leaving the minimum amount of discretion to judges. The European, the UK public opinion never understood that they joined a civil law union where you have to have detailed rules for, for everything. So does our questioner I, have a point? Is there a I, job I think the questioner of, has a point, yeah. but I would say it's not just in respect of the consequence on the Irish border, but the consequence on the border in Dover, for example, yeah. uh, goods entering the port of Dover that are coming from a non-EU country, that lorry takes 45 minutes to process through the port of Do Dover. Goods coming to the port of Dover from the EU, three minutes to get yeah. through. Yeah. That's yeah, Im imagine now the delays that are going to be in Britain. I feel that in a sense, Britain will never abandon the idea of Brexit until it has actually Brexited. And then yeah. it will see for itself for the first time what they have done. Right. And maybe at that stage they'll reverse themselves if pride doesn't prevent them from, okay. from so doing. Okay, I'm going to take another uh, questioner just up here near the front. If you keep your hand up. Thank you. It's Alan Dukes, I think. Yeah. Alan Dukes, yes, former politician. Um, I, I remember Anglo-Irish relations before 1973. Um, at a political level, it was kind of morosely deferential on our side and morosely patronising on the British side. And I remember Anglo-Irish free trade area agreements, which were grossly unbalanced in favour of the UK, and we were petitioning to get participation in the UK deficiency payment system for agriculture. Brexit was an emotional decision. It's been said to me that it was the authentic... Just, I think the microphone has given up. It it's kind of died. Yeah, there you go. It's Brexit. Um, <laughs> Brexit was the authentic voice of England, and not of the United Kingdom. And if you look at the votes in Northern Ireland and Scotland, uh, that, that comes out very clearly. But it's an emotional decision, and when emotion comes in, and most referendums turn on emotion, um, rationality gets kind of pushed to the side. But as John has just said, the British might find out that Brexit means something very different from the emotional decision uh, that they made, which leads me to wonder if we shouldn't be putting 
a lot of pressure on the British side of this negotiation to say what they mean when they want to gain freedom to negotiate trade agreements with other countries. Uh, many people in this room will remember the process of harmonization of legislation that Boris Johnson used to make a mockery of uh, and the, the construction of the single market which was largely pushed by Margaret Thatcher and in the Commission was pushed by Commissioner Lord Coalfield. It was a British idea for a very, very good commercial reasons. So we should now be saying to the British, please explain to us and indeed to yourselves where you want to diverge from the regulations that we have and why. Yeah. Because I think that's for British industry and employment in the UK are potentially most at risk. Yeah. They and their 53 trade agreements, two more coming up with Mexico and Japan that they want to be part of. But we should be putting pressure on them to understand and to explain why they want to diverge because divergence will become a huge problem. And okay. personally, I think, picking up on John Bruton's last point, that if we have an agreement that allows them to diverge, the first time they start to diverge, they will soon find that it's an extremely bad idea and probably not go any further with it. I think that's okay. probably the way. Okay, I'm going to take another questioner. She's down at the back. If you keep your hand up until we get a microphone to you. Yes. Uh, thank you. Tanya Harrington, Powers Court. I'd like to thank the panel for their contribution. One question. Notwithstanding the current political um, and process challenges, um, I would welcome the views of the panel on what additional constitutional powers would need to be devolved to Northern Ireland to give practical effect to regulatory alignment in the event of a hard Brexit. Thank you. Okay, Brian, can I put that, those two first to you, the constitutional powers that would need to be devolved to Northern Ireland? Well, I, I must say it's not an issue that I've thought of in, in detail up to now, but I agree that there are devolved powers available to the Northern Ireland Executive they're not full governmental powers. And um, if there is to be this regulatory alignment as part of the UK, or if there's a special arrangement for the, for the, for the Northern Ireland, particularly, as I say, on the agricultural side, um, that would have to be implemented, I presume, at Westminster level, based on present arrangements. Because the relationship between the EU and yes, Britain is, is organized is, 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 from is, is, is Westminster. It's at a governmental level. So, yeah. but I think that whatever whatever would be required there to give effect to what was agreed, I don't see any problem with the Westminster Parliament acceding to that and making sure it happens. And the point that Alan Dukes has made, that we need to get the British to say what they mean by di diversity. Yes, well, I'm sure, I'm sure, you know, we don't, we're not party to the, to, to the discussions that go on inside in the rooms between Mr. Barney and Mr. Davis, but I'm sure these are precisely the sort of questions that they're seeking answers to. I mean, You've, we've heard of the situation, and this is only anecdotal. You hear that, you know, Mrs. May meets Mrs. Merkel, and Mrs. Merkel says, what do you want? And Mrs. May says, well, what will you put on offer for me? You know, there's, there's a lot of dancing around the issues without, everyone seems to be, you know, give us your bottom lines. And then when you get all the bottom lines, it's very hard to square the circle to meet the requirements of, of what the British have said they want. So you then come to the point that uh, has been said in yesterday's paper, it's not a question of what, what you want, it's a question of what we can give and what we can get without m messing up the integrity of the, of the market mechanisms we have ourselves. Uh, and then you're told, well, there's a technology answer to the customs things, and then you find, well, there isn't really a, a whiz there that's going to sort all that out, that there'll have to be more detailed discussion on that. So, you know, we, we are, in, in front, one of the reasons I only a relative recent uh, person to talk about Brexit is because I didn't know what the hell it was that like, could come, come to the point and say, well, where are we on all of this? There's a lot of surmise and a lot of speculation. But we are getting to the point now of moving from the generality of saying, yes, this has major repercussions for us and the IIEA are to be complimented under the leadership of Rory Quinn for all of the work that they've been doing. I mean, there, a tremendous amount of work has been done to bring to the fore uh, what the issues are and how we need to strategically work our way through this. But at the same time, I think in the next few months, we hope that some clarity will come to it by June. Otherwise, yeah. you know, the uncertainty it, that it breeds will, will bring a lot of 
a lot of worry to, to business on both sides of the border and indeed both sides of the Irish Sea. Brian, it's funny, but one of the first times perhaps that I began to realise or to see anything which made more concrete the notion of Brexit was that picture of that vast ferry in the papers over the weekends, the sort of ferry that can bypass Britain and bring our goods to, to Europe. Suddenly there was something that was saying, yeah, this is what we're going to have to do. Sorry, John, you want yeah, to Yeah, I, I, I think on, on Alan Jukes' question, I think there's a conflict going on within the UK government at the moment between Davis, who wants to do what Alan says should be done, set out what they want, and Downing Street and others who want to keep playing it pragmatically and saying as little as possible. Uh, and the reason Downing Street uh, is taking that view is they fear that if the British government sets out a model for Brexit, that somebody or some number of MPs on either side will fall away from the government and the government will fall. But it would certainly be in our interest, as Alan has intuited, for Britain to be required to spell out what they actually want, because it's only then that they'll see the cost side of what they're doing, because at the moment, as he said, they're dealing with the matter emotionally. I think the question at the back was really on the money in what she said about what powers would have to be devolved or taken back to Westminster, because it's the UK that's negotiating with Brussels about powers that have been devolved to Edinburgh, to Cardiff, and to Belfast. And there is a serious risk that the one other consequence of Brexit could be that the, the Scotland, for example, might be extremely angry with the decisions that have been made on its behalf by the UK government, which could precipitate it further in the direction of independence yeah. and weaken the UK. Uh, in respect of Northern Ireland, it, it, it's not as much of a problem because there isn't an administration, unfortunately, in Northern Ireland. But if the people of Northern Ireland do not want to have devolved government drained of all meaning mm. by decisions that are made in London, they need to get their devolved administration back up and running to speak up for Northern Ireland in respect of matters yeah. that affect Northern Ireland. Okay, um, we're, we're coming near the end, so there's a man here that has wanted to... Uh, would you keep your hand... It's Paul Gillespie. Would you keep your hand up there, Paul, until we get a, a microphone to you? Paul Gillespie, a member of the UK group in the Institute. Um, given the shifts um, uh, that uh, taking... Britain out of the, EU, uh, of the EU is, is going to uh, affect, in terms of British, British Irish regions, also within Northern Ireland, given the potential economic effects uh, and given the constitutional changes, including the potential ones in Scotland that John Bruton has referred to, do we need in the Republic a much more informed uh, discussion about uh, the possible constitutional futures, including unification, uh, because the structural changes that are happening in the UK's union and in the general relationship with the EU may force more rapid change than we're prepared for. Or, it, are we enough are we prepared for that? Do we need a kind of New Ireland forum once again to look at the, the options? Or is that kind of talk provocative and premature? Grand. Thank you, Paul. And I'm just going to take a last. There was a man with his hand up over there. Yeah. Would you... Uh, just wait till we get a microphone to you and if you could just stand up and tell us who you are. Yeah. Yeah, Joe Healy, President of the Irish Farmers Association and it was just um, back to I think a point that Bertie Ahern made in relation to calling it regulatory alignment or something that the UK would agree with. Uh, I'm just wondering how confident are the panel that the UK would agree with that, particularly from an agricultural point of view because of our dependence and, you know, each of the panellists have mentioned agriculture on a number of occasions, but if we go down the road that there's any grey area with the UK to go off and do trade deals, of course we want the market to the UK to remain as close as possible, access to it, but there's no point having access to a market that's undermined by their ability to go off and do trade deals elsewhere that undermines the value of that market. And speaking to the UK farmers, they're equally as afraid of that as, as we are. So just again, to the, how confident are they that, uh, that regulatory alignment could replace customs union or single market? Bertie. Um, 
Paul's question first, but Paul, I, I just think that would be dangerous. I, I think we would, uh, it would be seen as rattling up um, the, the vote and you know the border poll and, and, and those issues are just very, 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 very sensitive. So I, I think we, you know, there, there's an argument for looking at these things in the round, but I think to bring them in at, at this stage would, would, would complicate uh, and would certainly, I think, make it more difficult to get the institutions back up and, and running. The, in, as I understand it, because we're not privy to what's going on, but I think the, the Irish government and the Irish officials are, are trying their utmost uh, to get more substantive evidence from the British of what deal uh, precisely they're prepared to, to move to. And I think this has continued on now for, for a year. Um, and un, until, I, I presume, um, at an official level, they're, they're, they're arguing these issues out. I have no doubt that that's what's going on. Um, I, I think that needs to be done before the, the June meeting because agriculture is effectively the, the crucial, the crucial and, yeah. and, and biggest issue. Uh, but the, as of today, you're asking the question, are we confident? The answer is no, because the, there is no paper, if I'm, I might have this wrong, but as far as I know, there is no paper on the uh, British position has been presented to the Irish government as of today. So yeah. as of today, we're, we cannot be confident. I think the case has been well made, and the evidence has been given, I think the officials are well across the agricultural issue, but the British government have not given uh, any clear indication other than uh, the fairly brief aspirations that we've seen now okay. for 12 months. And because we're coming to an end, a, a quick comment, Bran Cowan, on yeah, Paul Gillespie's question. Just quickly on question. Paul said, I mean, I agree with Bertie on, on, on the, the north-south aspect, but I think that there's a huge need now, and I think it was starting to be reflected in some of the articles as, as late as yesterday, um, Conor Brady and, and Senator McDougall, this whole question of Michael McDougall, the question of what's the relationship that we're going to have now that Britain are leaving. That's a crucial issue for us. And we haven't had this, despite the best efforts of people like yourself, Paul, for many years, you've been a, a minority voice in trying to incorporate the European issue into the domestic politics of the country. We don't sufficiently discuss this issue until when it comes to constitutional changes or treaty changes and then find, of course, outside that with the public that they're not up to speed because we haven't incorporated these issues into our domestic politics sufficiently and shown the, the relevance of the, what's happening at European level to the day-to-day -day lives of our own people. That's a, a constant problem we've had. But I, I think that, you know, Jean-Claude Juncker's State of the Union speech last, last year where he's saying, you know, we need to have a, a review of what it is the Europe wants to do and in what areas it wants to do it. I mean, the question of a digital union, the question of an energy union, the question of uh, the mechanism that we had for the, for, for, for the crisis being transferred into a, a European monetary fund type arrangement. There are a whole range of major policy questions, a banking union, for example, a whole range of major policy questions that have to be addressed coherently by the 26th. Right. Uh, and that will need a, a lot of discussion here as to who our, our, you know, who our comrades are going to be in the discussions okay. that will take place. John, a last and quick point, particularly on Paul's question about do we need to start talking, for instance, about a United Ireland? Well, I, I think the advice that's given to a barrister uh, who is interrogating a witness, don't ask a question unless you know what the answer is going to be, <laughs> applies to this. To engage on a speculative voyage of discovery about all sorts of constitutional policy, pol possibilities, I think would be potentially quite risky uh, for all the reasons that Bertie just yeah. gave, because it would again divide the community in Northern Ireland even more radically between the two. In my view, the future, a peaceful future for this island is, has to come in stages. And the first stage has to be a creation of a mutual uh, sense of mutual identity between the two communities in Northern Ireland that they come to feel that they have more in common with one another, which they do, than they have with either here or London. And on that will grow, from that will grow a sense of self-confidence and collective decision-making, from which will grow the possibility okay. of a decision that might work. Okay. But to pose a question prematurely 
in a fashion that would simply divide opinion Northern Ireland, in Northern Ireland on traditional lines, no matter which way the vote went, no matter which way the vote went, could be deeply destructive. OK, we will end on that note. And I'm going to ask the three, Tishi, to just remain on stage uh, for a moment because having heard the voices of experience in Ireland and later on, of course, we're going to hear some of the most experienced uh, figures on the EU stage. But what about the next generation? We're now going to hear emerging voices on the future of the EU in 2050. Five students from leading universities on the island of Ireland with their vision for the future of the EU. And our first speaker is from Trinity College Dublin. She's Mary Sophie Hingst, a PhD candidate, and she's going to talk about embracing difference. Um, good morning, um, dear Tishi, dear ladies and gentlemen. As it is impossible to predict the future, looking into the past sometimes offers insights that prove valuable in how we imagine a European future. Doing so allows us to detect moments when indeed the future inevitably was changed. One of such moments took place right across the street here in Trinity College Dublin. At the end of the 19th century, 10,000 women signed a petition demanding access to college. Their efforts met, unsurprisingly, fierce resistance, but they remained resilient. Finally, in 1904, the board was forced to relent when it received a royal patent allowing women to receive full degrees. But this particular moment had far greater implication than to astonish conservative professors and to allow Sophie Bryant, the first female doctor of mathematics, to ride on her bike over campus. The decision to make Trinity a mixed campus supported the course of female students all over Europe. Between 1904 and 1907, Trinity played host to the so-called steamboat ladies, female graduates from England who were denied degrees by their own universities. Thus, 722 women boarded a boat to receive the degree they had earned alongside their male peers. The anecdote of the steamboat ladies is not exclusively a tale from the past about female empowerment or their strive for equality in Europe, but it comes as a reminder uh, for the future that it is not the individual, even though many of those women pioneered and excelled in their field, but that cooperation is essential for the success of all. Earlier than other, they realized the only alternative in a globalized world are various forms of interaction. But recently, looming Brexit and fierce resistance by Eastern European member states to accepting refugees from war torn Syria and Libya exposed the limits of the idea of a shared European identity. In this distinct moment of crisis, it seems crucial to keep the courage of the steamboat ladies in mind that only a Europe that is not afraid to cravel debate and argue about difficult topics, and I think in the next 25 years, all topics, be they of political, social, or economical nature, will be challenging, and to explore existing differences while being willing to be persistent and resilient when it comes to defend essential values as its strongest, shaping the future for the better. Sophie Bryant once described the Irish as a community of spirit. Being Irish in this sense equals with being European. A better wish for the future of Europe is hard to find, and it is upon us now to find a steamboat that keeps this very spirit alive for all of us. Thank you very much. And our next speaker comes from NUI Maynooth. Uh, Michael Barrett is an undergraduate, and he's going to speak about defending democracy. Ladies and gentlemen, in this day and age, with the return and consistent upsurge of identity, extreme, and populist politics, it all too often seems to me that with each and every electoral process, that the democratic world seems to be crossing the Rubicon into a world of the unknown. 
Democracy, both within and outside of Europe, is in a state of stagnation. Within Europe and neighboring states, from Viktor Orban's Hungary to Putin's Russia and Erdogan's Turkey, backsliding into the authoritarian politics of old persists, often born out of the genuine concern insecurities of normal citizens unsure of their futures and no longer trusting of mainstream democratic politics, a theme evident throughout the democratic world. This is a particular challenge for the EU. That of Hungary and Poland had been held up as stellar examples of what an EU-guided transition to democracy could achieve. The extent of rule of law backsliding and, sorry, has been truly alarming and has caused doubt of the EU's capacity to positively impact political and societal transformation. There should be a clear link established between the dispersal of EU subvention, principally structural funds, and compliance with rule of law in the member states. If the EU is anything, it is a union of rules and rule of law, and if those rules are subject to such serious violation, the union itself shall be hollowed out of its founding democratic impulses. But it is due to this very reality that the EU must act and act now. With the ambiguous status of the United States, which looks to be returning to a protectionist state of isolationism, and the sombre exit of the UK from the European Union, the growing influence globally of authoritarian states, be it the People's Republic of China, or Putin's Russia on the international stage, which need not acknowledge that of human rights or democratic politics in their affairs, such as global trade. It is therefore, in my view, the EU's responsibili responsibility, if not duty, to unite, reassert, and defend itself as a bastion of democracy on an international stage now and into the future. This really means standing up for Articles 2 and 6 of the Treaty of the European Union, namely the respect for human dignity freedom, democracy, equality, upholding the rule of law and fundamental rights. Therefore, the Europe of 2050 that I would like to see is one in a world that revolves less around leaders and leadership and more around civil society, activism, engagement and impact on politics, both within Europe and globally. Thank you. Our third speaker is from University College Cork. She's Kathleen Jeffers, an undergraduate, and her theme is Going Back to Basics. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, my vision for the European Union in 2050 is a braver European Union, a stronger actor on the international stage. By 2050, we will face new and different global threats in areas such as cybersecurity, climate change, economics, security and migration. The European Union of 2050 must, first and foremost, have the capacity to protect its citizens from these threats and to robustly represent the views of its member states on the international stage. The European Union needs to demonstrate collective strength and shared resolve in order to achieve that. By strengthening its internal basis, by revisiting and respecting its core principles, the EU can be more outward looking and be a greater force for good in today's troubled world. I believe that the European Union needs to go back to basics in order to achieve this, back to the original conception of the Union and the principles upon which it was founded, namely the Treaty of Rome and the Four Freedoms. <coughs> Article 3 of the Treaty of Rome tells us the that the activities of the community shall include the elimination, as between member states, of restrictions on the import and export of goods, and the abolition, as between member states, of obstacles to freedom of movement for persons, services, and capital. Clearly, the four freedoms present different challenges to different member states. However, it's vital to the future success of the European Union that we strengthen these critical building blocks to achieve a more cohesive union, better able to develop and prosper in the future. In the European Commission's white paper on the future of Europe, Jean-Claude Juncker says that it's time for us to remind ourselves of the values that bind us together. And I agree with him. In my opinion, the unwillingness of member states to fully accept and implement the four freedoms has led to the weakening of the foundations of Europe. 
I wholeheartedly believe that my vision for the European Union in the year 2050, a braver, stronger actor on the international stage tackling the global threat of 2050, can be achieved. But it can only do this if the Union's fundamentals are sound, if the EU goes back to basics. As a young person in today's Europe, my horizons are international. For the European Union to thrive, develop, and meet future threats and challenges, it needs to adopt a similar outlook. Going back to basics can help shape a better future for me, for you, and for all of the citizens of Europe. Thank you. And our fourth speaker is from University College Dublin. He's Sean Dunn, a master's student, and Sean is going to speak about security. Uh, good morning. We've been tasked with the job this morning of looking into the future and envisioning what the European Union is going to look like in 2050. Of course, none of us has a looking glass, but given our current climate, all we can do is take an educated guess as to what we may expect. By no means is this an easy task. We live in an age now where many things are changing, sometimes by the second, and we can expect this to continue into the future. When I sat down to write this over the weekend, I thought about being 28 years old and a part-time master's student in politics in UCD. But by 2050, I will be 60 years old and many things will have changed. There are many pressing issues within the EU presently, but what has struck out in my mind for some time now is the ever-growing concern surrounding security and defence in Europe. For the first time now, terrorism is seen as a major challenge facing the European Union in our current climate. Terrorism is now top of the issues that citizens within the European Union cite when it comes to challenges currently being faced. Immigration, which has been a top concern since spring 2015, is now second, the most frequently cited challenge. Terrorism is well ahead of the economic situation. Through my work as a journalist over the past number of years, Breaking news stories of terrorist attacks have sadly become all too common in newsrooms across the world. In 2015, the horrific attacks on the city of Paris and the Battle Clown Theatre broke as I sat on the late news desk. 130 people died that night in one of the worst terrorist attacks to hit Europe. In the following days, I was tasked with interviewing survivors, including Irish people, and hearing these stories makes me realize that one of our greatest difficulties facing Europe is now protecting its citizens from future attacks like these. London, Madrid, Paris, and Germany have all been targeted, and this has sent ripples of fear across Europe. But it is our job as the future voices within Europe to try and stamp out this fear. We need to continue to place security and protection of EU citizens, and on a global level, to the forefront of society. I think as we look ahead to the years ahead and, we, and what we want to have achieved by 2050, it is important that public support for migrants remains in sharp focus. Since the series of terrorist attacks that have swept Europe in the past two years, support for migration has dwindled, and this is an issue that we, the future voices, must keep a watchful eye on in the years to come. These attacks have exposed a lack of security cooperation among European nations, and this is what we, the future voices of the EU, must work hard to improve upon. And I feel greater lines of communication and transparency must be kept open between member states in the years to come. Thank you. And finally, from Queen's University, Belfast, Lisa Whitten, who's doing her PhD. And Lisa is going to speak about the EU, a framework for connection. Thank you. As I'm now the last obstacle between yourselves and a cup of coffee, I'll keep this brief. In 1978, John Money set forward his conviction that by holding to new fixed principles created to guide European integration, we on the continent would inevitably be led to a United States of Europe. Respectfully, I disagree. In a world of hyperconnection, the international arena is less predictable and more complex meaning that the nature of the state is changing, 
states are becoming less static as our networks, identities and affiliations cross-cut, overlap, intermingle and span the globe. On this premise, I would suggest that the United States of Europe is not inevitable, rather that the EU already reflects the kind of open-endedness that polities require in order to thrive in the present and future realm of international relations. Since its foundation, there has been a struggle for language over the nature and direction of European integration. Is this intergovernmentalism writ large or federalism in waiting? Is the EU a collection of states bound solely by law or a new recon or a new configuration of Anderson's imagined community. In this sense, the EU has an asymptotic quality. It is as a line that tends towards but never reaches its destination. Under the vision of ever closer union, the ultimate goal is unstated. It matters not what we become, just that we do it together. It is a union premised on process, a consensus of means. But what if the constructively ambi ambiguous <laughs> constructively ambiguous lack of destination of the EU were reimagined not as a reason for dispute or issue to solve, but rather as the very essence of the whole endeavour. A few weeks ago, we commemorated the signing of the Good Friday Belfast Agreement, another constructively ambiguous entity based on a consensus of means, wherein the constitutional character of Northern Ireland became subordinate to the ways in which we choose to interact. I am both Irish and British. I am a European and I am from Northern Ireland. My collection of identities are made possible in an international framework of multiplicity that the EU exemplifies and should pursue. So in short, my vision for a 93-year-old European Union is not more Europe, read federalism, or less Europe, read intergovernmentalism, but a third way, dynamic Europe a place characterised by its nexus of multiple, overlapping and ever-changing institutions, institutions that are defined by complexity, unashamedly open to evolution and that serve as points of connection and means of collaboration for the diverse group of people and peoples living on the continent. Thank you very much. <laughs>